So that's wonderful to welcome everybody today um, on behalf of the Center for International Policy Studies at the University of Ottawa. Uh, my name is Anna Bojek, I'm the coordinator of SIPS, and we have the great, great pleasure to organize a book launch for uh, Professor Ruby Dagger. Uh, and the discussant today will be Christoph, Professor Christoph Zerker. Um, the, the title of the book, and I will be sharing the link uh, shortly with you, uh, is um, Reconstruct, Reconstructing Our Understanding of State Legitimacy in Post-Conflict States, uh, Building on Local Perspectives. And for those of you who uh, have access to the library at the University of Ottawa, I will be sharing a link where you can access it directly. And uh, for those of you outside of the University of Ottawa, I'll be sharing with you the link uh, to the publisher website. So just to let you know about those things. So um, Professor Christoph Zerker is a professor with the Graduate School of uh, Public, Affair, Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. Uh, he has written widely on post-conflict states, including Afghanistan, and uh, uh, Professor Ruby Dagger is a replacement professor with the School of International Development and Globalization. Um, she has, uh, I believe Christoph will also introduce her a little bit, but uh, I know that SIPS has collaborated on a few occasions with Professor Dagger on conflict in the Middle East, um, namely Lebanon and a few other topics. Um, and we have the great pleasure of welcoming both of you today. So we'll let Professor Christ Christoph Zerker take over. Well, thank you so much for, for this introduction. I will be very, very brief because the floor really belongs to, to that book. And I, I do know that book projects such as these, they, they, they take years, they years in the making, right? That's, uh, it, it's not only about the research that too, but it's also about the idea and then thinking about the idea and specifying the idea and going forth and back. So, you know, it's, it's a long, long process and it came to a, to a fantastic conclusion, I think. So the book is really at the center of today's book talk. So I, I think that's all I'm gonna say. I'm just gonna hand over the floor to Ruby uh, to present that, that book. And then afterwards we have a time to discuss. Ruby, floor is all yours. Thank you, Christoph, and thank you, Anna. Um, so absolutely, this was uh, a labor of love, uh, but also a, a very painful labor of love. I, the idea for this, not book, but this research topic really came about, I think, when I was about 10 and I was in the Civil War in Lebanon and I had questions that I never had answers for. And it was mostly about why do you do my parents and other people, older people around me always support the same people over and over again, even though um, we're not coming to a good conclusion, even though we don't have stability, even though they're undoing the state itself. Uh, and so that that sort of questioning stayed with me. And then as I as I went through my studies um, and as I worked at the um, at that time was Canadian International Development Agency, different parts of the Middle East, but also looking at different countries, those questions were never really answered for me. And so that turned into my PhD research. Um, and it, it was something that was a labor of love. And you know, when you take on something that really looks at things from a different perspective, it does take much longer than um, a case study per se. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping that what, what I would be showing you today, which is snippets of the, of, of I think the most important parts of the book um, will help sort of get us to start thinking about things a bit differently and trying to see things from a different perspective. Um, and to do so, what I thought I would do um, is sort of start off with what the dilemma is, um, then go into <laughs> the hot, uh, difficult concept of legitimacy and unpacking that a little bit. And I'm very conscious of the fact that, you know, hundreds of years have been put into this research. And I, even when I was a PhD um, candidate, I was told about all this amount of research and why would I be able to contribute something to it given the significant number of people that have passed, uh, you know, that have contributed to this topic. So um, I'm hoping I still have something to contribute and I'm hoping you, you feel this way as well. Um, so unpacking legitimacy and then really talking about performance legitimacy, which is not something I came up with, which is something that existed before, um, but really it existed in the margins. And so I kind of, I brought a little bit more in and, and really highlighted its importance and the implications of it. And so we'll do that um, and then we'll conclude in the book. Initially, you know, when I was looking at it really, again, 
developed from my own experience, um, but also very much uh, an issue, in my opinion, that was related to conflict, post-conflict. And I have to be very careful when I talk about post-conflict, because are we ever really post-conflict even after you know several years? And in a lot of cases that we, we are looking at, are we really post-conflict? Um, and the answer often that I give for that is that if it's deemed to be post-conflict from an international community perspective, where we're engaging with the state to build this capacity, engaging with the state to kind of, you know, have a new constitution, to have a, a new political system. So those processes that are established by the international community or by the, the state itself in what it wants to do next, um, that's sort of how I'm defining post-conflict from this perspective. And then we'll conclude. Um, so the dilemma for me, again, I kind of quickly highlighted this when I, when I talked about my childhood, but the idea is that, you know, in a lot of places we do have electoral democratic systems and structures, especially once we go in and we try to establish them or help them establish their own. Um, and, you know, th there are people that go uh, and express their desire to be represented in the in the in the government and to 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 have elections uh, or what they define as elections um, or accountability or how they define as accountability and often we hear uh, uh, many people complain about corruption that there isn't really true representation there's inefficiency in the governance system um, that the government doesn't care about them and so forth but at the same time we often also see the same people coming back or people kind of re-electing or supporting the same people who were there before. And often you hear them really, if you kind of dissect that criticism in a lot of cases, it's criticizing the other, but not mine. And if mine made a mistake, I might admit it, my leader, I might admit it, but it's within the context and he had to most of the time, it's he, he had to, or he's, you know, his situation is really difficult, therefore, and so we find excuses for that. Um, and so what's, why isn't there that much of an uptake done by amazing sometimes local non-governmental organizations to show that corruption at all levels? Why, why isn't that galvanizing people to really want sort of enough people, I should say, to really want a, a change? So that for me was, was really important and when I was looking at this. And so the initial start for, it, for me was to say, okay, hold on a minute. Um, and maybe because again, I lived in a different situation than, than a stable democratic system. Um, and part of this process, when I was doing my research initially was to say, okay, I wanna look at how, if the state is legitimate in the eyes of the people. Well, first of all, you know, what's legitimacy? Like how, how are we defining legitimacy so that I can use those indicators or those these measures to actually see what type of legitimacy there is. And that comes again from the definition of the state, which I use a very, very, very basic definition of the state, uh, which is really the structures and institutions that are responsible or that have budgets and are responsible for people. So, you know, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry, so really just the, the systems and the structures in place and not the political level per se. Okay. And so when I was looking at these indicators um, on how we actually measure legitimacy, uh, and I did significant amount of research on this and, you know, great literature, so World Bank, IMF, uh, um, um, UN, OECD, all sort of this non- non-academic quote-unquote literature, but also academic literature, going back to the 1960s, 70s, even 1800s at certain points. And what I was able to pull out were these that you see on your screen, accountability, civil liberties, good governance, human rights, rule of law, constitution, GDP, independent, free independent media, property rights, corruption, political parties. And so I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see. And so I sat there, and I thought to myself, whoa, are these really indicators of legitimacy or are these indicators of democracy? and the level of democracy that actually exists. Um, and that really helped me kind of step a little bit outside that box or that sort of um, way of looking at things and start to sort of want to see things from a different perspective because I thought to myself, well, if this is what we're measuring legitimacy as, um, how do we measure the legitimacy of the Chinese state system? Um, how do we measure the legitimacy of, uh, I don't know, most of the countries that are not as democratic, advanced in their democratic levels or even democratic at all? Are they then not legitimate at all? Is the state not even legitimate just because they don't have these properties? Um, and so 
what I what I I found and kind of thinking about this and, and and breaking this apart and doing my research and I'll come back to some of this um, a little bit later as well is that really the definition of legitimacy and this is something that I think a lot of us uh, a lot of academics would hate to 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 work with uh, is that it depends it depends on the people it depends on how the people see their own state their own country the history that they have and it's not necessarily properly captured by specific indicators that just assess a system per se. Um, and the legitimacy, again, depends on the state society relationship, that local ideology, but also other relevant factors, social factors that we see. Um, and it's not just about systems. Um, it's really very much uh, from, from, from a people's perspective, very much based on their own perception and their own beliefs. And when I started thinking about that, and then I started thinking about the potential that legitimacy is not necessarily something that is just systemic. It's not something that's within a system, per se, and within an institution, per se. Um, which then, again, doing all this research, especially using political science literature, um, going back to the 1970s, I was able to come up with sort of this, this type of a, of a, of a diagram, um, looking at really the major sources of legitimacy. There are others, but the major ones that we often, we used to talk about, at least in the 1970s, and a lot of them we don't talk about anymore so much. So the idea of process legitimacy, which is what we just saw, which was, you know, rule of law, really very much and related to legitimacy of a democratic system per se, but there's also international legitimacy. So that recognition um, from the international community, there's also that shared beliefs that I was sort of talking about, people believing that it is a state, people believing that, or a country, that there is, you know, there is a, a legitimacy to this. But there's also that little part of the legitimacy in the 70s, it didn't used to be called performance legitimacy. That's sort of, a, I think, that term was more or less in the 2000s that we started using it, but that's, you know, that, that, that term really reflects basically that relationship of what are you doing for me and how are you earning my legit, that, that legitimacy from my part. So really very much um, associated with um, the benefits from the system that's coming. And the idea here is that for a country like Canada, for example, it would have, um, it would have all four. Uh, and Canada would be kind of situated right in the middle because we do have shared beliefs, most, most of us, except for some of our communities um, within Canada. We have process legitimacy, we have international recognition, we have performance legitimacy. A place like China I made reference to earlier might not have the process legitimacy that we might think of, um, but yet they do have shared beliefs and they do have performance legitimacy and they do have international legitimacy. And the reason why I left out violence and, and um, control is because that's not something that really is legitimacy. That's sort of the control over of a, of a society that the people are not gonna see that leader as legitimate, but they're going to fear that leader. And that's sort of something that I kind of left on the side and you'll see later why and how it kind of shows itself through the process. So you'll see also some a place like, for example, Palestine um, would not fit into an international recognition. Um, it doesn't have that international legitimacy. Some people would question the level of process legitimacy um, as well. But again, that's just to, show, to, to say that you don't have to have all four um, to be able to then have legitimacy. But if you don't have any of these, then we start questioning whether you actually do have sources of legitimacy. And I think that's a more helpful way uh, to look at legitimacy than it is just to kind of measure whether it meets certain requirements based on a democratic system um, and, and, and democratic measures. Um, and so the idea, if I was to take you back to that little part that's called performance legitimacy, um, quickly, I talked about why it is important um, from the perspective of meeting the needs of the, of the citizens. Um, when I was doing a lot of this research, again, performance legitimacy existed as, as, as legitimacy, but it was always secondary or tertiary, um, especially secondary to process legitimacy in a sense where let's build the political system on a democratic perspective, but then we also need know that at the same time in the short term, people need to feel, feel some benefits. And so we have to perform a little bit to keep people convinced in this project. And so it was used as a means for process legitimacy and not by itself as, as an importance of itself. Um, and often we talk about how, how could you get 
performance legitimacy if you don't have a democratic system, which then ensures equality and equity for everybody. Um, and so people criticize performance legitimacy from that perspective. They also criticize this from the perspective of saying, well, it's really hard to figure out what people want. Um, and it's very true. And the European Union tried to do this um, before uh, in, the, in the early 2000s into the 2010s, trying to figure out how to increase the legitimacy of the European Union through performance legitimacy. But then they found out that it's so hard because people's desires and needs are very complex. But we have to also think back about at what position are we, at what point in time are we talking about, number one, and number two, based you know, what level, if I could say, so if you think of Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs, you know, most Europeans have their basic needs that are met. And so for me, when I was looking at conflict, when I was looking at places that um, have suffered from conflict or from severe fragility, state fragility per se, I realized that there was a lot of, there were a lot of issues to accessing basic services. So water, electricity, education, health service, security, shelter, et cetera. And so I focused on that sort of, you know, one of the lev lowest levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I thought to myself, okay, at that level, we can, we can, we can tell what people want. It's not that complicated and it's not that hard. Are there differences in how people see who's responsible for what? Absolutely. But at the same time, we can try to work with that because it's not as complicated as trying to get, figuring out, you know, people's needs um, that are much more um, above the basic level per se. But what I, what we also recognize with performance legitimacy, and this is something where I think I've contributed quite a bit to in this, in, in this research, is that performance legitimacy is the legitimacy that is not exclusive to the state. Uh, this is the type of legitimacy that can be earned by people, by groups, uh, whether it's civil society groups or militias, um, by different levels of the state. And sometimes it could be held by different entities. So it could be held by the municipality, but at the same time also by the leader. And it, that make that perception by the population as the whole holds legitimacy is really, really important because then that, that has implications for what one does when it comes to building state institutions, for example. Um, and you again, you, it's the perception of the people. So even if let's say the resources are being paid for uh, publicly by the state, if the people perceive them as coming from a leader, then that leader would amass that performance legitimacy and not the state itself. Um, and that takes me again to this idea of state capacity and really looking at the fact that in a lot of the cases that I was looking at specifically, um, those were the cases where there was a destruction, um, not perhaps of all of the country, uh, but the places where there was significant um, conflict and significant destruction from the conflict and realizing that at that point, either the state wasn't present or if it was, it was hostile to certain groups and it didn't really have the capacity to work, uh, to, to provide these services. And so the idea also from uh, very much sort of a post-conflict uh, um, state building perspective and the liberal approach that we have and the various versions of the liberal approach is always to say, okay, well, we need to build state's capacity to be able to deliver developmental policies, goods and services. And it's also important from a performance legitimacy perspective to say, it's the state that's providing these services. So it's important that we recognize the state. But then the idea is, okay, what, what does really happen when we try to build the state institutions. Um, taking into consideration that performance legitimacy is really important and it could be held by people as well as institutions. Um, and that led me again to kind of unpack more the idea of performance legitimacy and throughout my research that I did, which is really looking at significant literature um, and other case studies. Uh, and then again, looking at three cases, Senegal, Lebanon, and South Sudan was to realize that um, Performance legitimacy is really, really important for people. It's much more important than, or, or having their basic needs being met is much more important for a lot of the people uh, and the majority of the people in these areas than to be able to go vote, for example. Um, while there are people who want to vote at the lowest level, still there is that need for basic services. Um, and so that, the idea then is that if, if performance legitimacy is really important, at the same time, we know that the state has very low performance legitimacy in these conflict areas or areas that have suffered a lot. And so what we also know is that even during conflict, there isn't a lack of legitimacy. Leaders hold legitimacy because a lot of leaders um, take care of their base, of their people, so that they can continue aging more. And so leaders have amassed 
performance legitimacy and they try to protect it and abuse the system to protect it. And so there's this basic competition uh, for performance legitimacy. Um, and so, you know, while the process legitimacy is low during those moments, especially if we measure it according to sort of a democratic system, um, performance legitimacy plays a significant role. And we cannot undermine that in the wait for process legitimacy. And so that I kind of together um, there's this, this uh, performance legitimacy theory of transition. I published it in a 2018 paper, so it's not forthcoming, it's 2018 paper, uh, but I use it also in the book as well. And quickly just to show, and these are two extremes of the continuum, the idea is that if we're building state institutions and we're not taking into consideration the performance legitimacy of the leaders, um, and we're not trying to, to understand how they're controlling this building of state institutions, we're going to end up in a vicious cycle, which was the one on top with the orange uh, arrows to say that they will continuously undermine the state and show themselves to be the most important. And we can expand on that later if you'd like. If the state is capable of capturing this performance legitimacy by showing its importance to the people through state building, um, then it would be a virtuous one where it would increase its positive attitudes towards the people, which then increases its performance legitimacy. Um, and then it has sort of a, a, a double effect thereafter and it's a continuous process. And so what I, what I really wanted to highlight in the book is that waiting for that performance, uh, so that for that process legitimacy to happen while using performance legitimacy in the meantime, um, ignores the reality on the ground. And that reality is that those leaders will take care of their own and peace is fragile. And there's minimal or lack of, in some cases, national identities that they can sort of hang on to. And the state capacity is weak. And that opens up Pandora's box, basically, especially if we're not realizing, again, not only the system and structure, but the people and the leaders holding these, these, this legitimacy. Um, the fact that people are looking for quick results, so the peace dividend, they want their lives to improve. Um, you know, they want their state to be relevant. Uh, they want their, uh, they want to be able to trust others, but they can't at the moment. They trust their own leaders because of the, all the atrocities or the problems that have happened because of the other leaders um, that are brought into this, this governing stru structure or governing system, right? And so then you start seeing, I'm not going to go through all of them, but then you start seeing the sort of importance of looking at it from the people's perspective. Um, and so what I did was, in looking at it from that perspective and realizing the importance of performance legitimacy, um, and as a Lebanese, I can't get, let go of the Lebanon case, um, I had to go back. Um, and out of 64 cases that I looked at, I ended up with three. Um, and what was really interesting for me in these three case studies that I looked at, which was Lebanon, Senegal, and South Sudan, is that there were many commonalities and several differences. And that com these commonalities and differences as an analysis came up over a period of time. So I went back in each and every single one of them to at least the early 1900s, if not before. So I looked at it from a temporal perspective to look at potential path dependencies or critical junctures um, to see if there's a difference across time. And I also looked at it across, across cases um, to try to better understand. But what I also did was I, I used the indicators that we often associate with um, causes for conflict um, with the definition of conflict, and then with what we think post-conflict stability would look like, or what's important in post-conflict stability um, and post-conflict development. And so I compared those across the three cases to kind of figure out what it meant. And quickly, you can see that there are a lot of commonalities when it comes to history of colonization, geopolitical influences, uh, level of social fracturing, the duration of the conflict, um, post-war violence, the corruption, uh, post-conflict corruption and conflict, corruption during the conflict, institution building, governance and reconciliation, elections, delivery of basic social services, post-conflict de decentralization, disarmament, demobilization and reintegration and market economies. So they all kind of had to various degrees, but very similar sort of um, experiences with these indicators that we consider to be very important. Then I looked at the differences and you can see sort of the colors that are the same, meaning that they're shared by Lebanon. Like for example, the red is shared by Lebanon and Senegal, the blue is shared all across, the green is between Senegal and South Sudan, and you can, and then Lebanon and South Sudan, there's a, a lighter blue, but you can see how there isn't really a consistency 
um, across indicators? There is it something that truly can explain to me what am I seeing? Why is something happening the way it is? Um, you know, whether it was during the conflict, before the conflict, um, and after the conflict. Right, I still couldn't figure out a tendency per se. Um, and some of these indicators are indicators that I had to kind of summarize in a, in a, in a, uh, in a category. Um, but in the book, I, I describe all of them through the chapters. I have specific chapters for each country. And the idea is that Senegal, again, I'm not talking about corruption. I'm not talking about the level of, the, of, of democracy. I'm more talking about really the legitimacy of the state, the stability of that, of the state and being able to move forward per se after the conflict. And what I realized pretty quickly was that, you know, even though Senegal and South Sudan have sort of some of the same um, indicators, for example, level of poverty or education, as an example, Senegal, uh, sorry, Lebanon and South Sudan shared more with the consequences of post-conflict and the instability than did Senegal and South Sudan. Um, and so that disconnect of why did Senegal have a more stable process through its independence movement in the Casamance, which is huge, wanting independence and then finally not wanting that much independence anymore for the majority of them, versus a country that is kind of breaking apart, which is Lebanon, versus South Sudan that got independence, but also starting to break apart. So I couldn't really understand from these indicators what, why we ended up where we ended up. And then I pulled out the performance legitimacy indicators and I thought, okay, I'm going to have to, because the, the, again, the problem with the indicators that we have for legitimacy are ones that measure democratic legitimacy. So I had to come up with indicators that measured performance legitimacy based on all the research that I had done, the theoretical uh, conceptual research that I had done in the literature review and came up with indicators for performance legitimacy. And we can, again, talk a little bit more about that um, later. But I, as I looked at the indicators for performance legitimacy, who was earning this legitimacy? I realized that in Lebanon and in South Sudan, it was the leaders. In Senegal, it was the state. And so people really started believing in the importance of the state, really started believing in the state and were able to move forward. Whereas the other ones, the state was being undermined by the leaders because the leaders were earning that, that performance legitimacy. And that's sort of what, what, what was more common between Lebanon and South Sudan um, than um, South Sudan and Senegal. And so in all three cases um, that I looked at performance legitimacy was very important, very valuable, much more than elections and rule of law, even though people talked about it, it the valuation was still really, you know, what, what the leaders were doing for them and taking care of their basic needs was much more important. Um, and so looking at that behavior of the citizens towards their leaders, especially those that are sitting inside the state, who are ministers and would come up and say, I brought you electricity, I brought you water. If it wasn't for me then, right? And then the citizens view of the state being incapable or as a place to protect ourselves from the others in the society. Um, and the key points and actors that the citizens really identified as important and more relevant when they were referring to their leaders were really, you know, about what they were receiving versus the other ones that were violent, um, the other ones that were using the system to hurt them, using that process legitimacy to hurt them. Um, and so you could see how um, in Senegal, people we really were able to see that these benefits were coming from the state. Leaders were not able to um, reorient to the conversation to say, we brought you these. There were, there were limitations on what the Senegalese were able to do, that what, what the, the Senegalese leaders were able to do within the state. And that, that, that control mechanism was not democracy. Um, that control mechanism, even though Every leader had a purse that would, they would be able to use to buy votes per se, uh, or what we would think of it to be buying votes. There was a limit every time they step out of line, there were, there were consequences by the president, for example. On the president, every time he stepped out of line, significant number of other politicians controlled the president. And so there was this natural balance between the two and, and the people's belief in the state that limited this abuse. And it wasn't sort of what we think about as transparency, accountability from a democratic perspective. It was a perfect no, but it was much better than Lebanon and South Sudan that had a more sort of democratic-like uh, process where there wasn't this control of the maneuvering space, as I call it. Okay. 
Um, and so that maneuvering space allowed them to abuse the state system, cry out against the others, but wink, wink, nod, nod, ignore what the others are doing and not make real change. And then always use it as an excuse where then, then people would be like, oh, it's their leaders, not mine, that is actually doing something about them. And so what it does it actually mean is that all of this, which is a liberal agenda, is not necessarily, or does not necessarily take into consideration more of the reality of where we're starting from, or the reality, not where we're starting, where, we're, where we are integrating into. And it assumes that there's a new page that is turned, and then there isn't. There's a continuation of something, and that's where performance legitimacy, in a lot of cases, plays an important role. Um, and, you know, again, I'm not going to read through all this, there's a lot of information, but the idea is that when we have a better state society relationship, and we have a more limited sort of maneuvering space where leaders can play the system, um, then the state can actually succeed in earning performance legitimacy, and we learned that really well from the, student, from the Senegalese case. Um, and we know that if we put emphasis on process legitimacy um, and that performance legitimacy is secondary to feed into process legitimacy, it opens that maneuvering space uh, for leaders to play around because at that moment it's more the performance legitimacy that's important. Um, and that the question that is still to be looked at, but we've seen evidence of this in many cases, when we're devolving, so more than just simple decentralization, when we're devolving state responsibilities to the local level, we're also, especially at a level where people are not really associated with a strong central state, we're also opening up more space for the maneuvering and more chances for the leaders to earn performance legitimacy for the state to lose it. Um, and so I leave you with this idea that legitimacy really is a, is a contested terrain. Uh, it's not something that we can just bring in through systems and structures. It's not something that just doesn't exist because there's conflict and therefore now we bring it in. It's definitely not ex exclusive to the state. Um, it could be held by people or institutions or structures. Um, and we need to really think about how to build this performance legitimacy of a state to then be able to have a stable long-term system that could potentially become democratic or could you know, integrate process legitimacy um, into it, but at least start at a point where um, we have a chance of, of stability and success. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ruby. That was a fascinating talk or a fascinating book. Um, I'm glad I knew the project because it, it is a complex matter, right? So I'm, I'm glad I knew it already a bit, but I'm always fascinated by, uh, uh, by the complexities of it. So one of the big lessons that, that for, from that research is, you know, it's simple, but the big lesson is things are complicated. Things are very complex. And especially if you go and look at the, at the ground, what's going on, then you know, all of a sudden one realizes that Many of the of the concepts, uh, the ideas, the theories, all the the need the need uh, binaries we have maybe don't work that well on the ground. So I mean that would be only in your case the case. That's probably the case in social science in general. But it's just very useful to remember that that things are complicated, and we all should make an effort to uh, unpack that complexity, which involves you know looking at what's going on on the ground or. Uh, in your case, also looking at what's been happening in the past and uh, having that puzzle with you, doing the case studies. So that's one thing. Um, and uh, in a nutshell, what I think, what well, for me stands out as as some of the the take home messages is three th three steps in a way. The first step is that you establish the importance of a performance legitimacy, which which is important. And I think very few people would disagree with that. So far, so good. Performance legit legitimacy matters. Uh, then the second step, which makes things more interesting, is that it's actually not only state actors who kind of crew such a, uh, earn such performance legitimacy, but also non-state actors. And maybe they are even better at it. So that would be a second step that takes us a little bit out of the... Uh, the, the things we are used to it. Um, but, but then the third step is when things get really interested. And that is that um, this performance legitimacy can also be 
gained by actors who act within the state and may even formally be state actors. But that performance legitimacy, which they gain from providing services, does not benefit the state, but it actually benefits those people, you know, who officially may be servants, public servants, but they do not act and think. They have different preferences than state actors. So that's very becomes really, really interesting. And I think that's that that's the problem uh, that, that we're facing when dealing with many, many of these countries, right? And it, it, it's, it's classic. We have these ideas of what a state looks, and it's a Western idea. And so we go to the ministry and it says ministry, and then inside that building is a ministry. So we assume that minister is a public servant and he acts like a public servant, that there's division between the public and the private, where actually it's not. So I think that's where it gets really interesting. I wanna, so we, we, we agreed that we're gonna have a conversation, not, not, not like me, uh, talking but asking questions and going forth and back so we're going to do this before i uh, start with my first question i want to remind the audience the participants that at any time you can leave questions in the q and a section so at the bottom of your screen there's a little tab q and a and you just type your questions i will be monitoring the questions and uh, then relate those questions to ruby okay my first question is this. I'm not sure how you're going to handle that, that question, but you no, know, we started your talk with uh, uh, saying it, the work went back many, many years, and there was a 10, year, 10 years old ruby in Lebanon in the Civil War. And there's two phrases that stuck with me. One is, I, I was kind of you know, watching, you were kind of watching. Uh, parents, the, 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 the grown-ups, and they were always uh, supporting the same people. And then the other phrase you said, like five seconds after that, and these other people were undoing the state. So that, that's, you know, 10-year-old Ruby observing the, the grown-up world, seeing that we were always supporting the same people, and these people were undoing the state. And I was just wondering, you now, so many years later, and having, you know, researched that and wrote the book about that. What would you be telling 10 years old Ruby or, or your parents now? Hmm. Well, I think, first of all, I would understand them. I, I would understand, uh, I, I, would, I would really be in full understanding of why they behave the way they did. I would not judge them anymore. And the reason why I would understand them is I would understand how their lives really depended on these people. And there were no other real alternatives that were coming up to you know, provide them with the basic needs, but at the same time, not undo the state. Um, and when you get to a point where the state is not functioning and you have it sort of being like an empty shell and a place where people just fight with each other, um, try to protect against groups, you need, the population needs to feel like there's something, somebody protecting them, something, somebody looking after them and doing the work to be able to provide them with the basic services, the basic protection, the basic needs. And so I wouldn't judge them as harshly as I did when I was 10, uh, because you know, I, I, I thought it was illogical, but I would, I would understand them. And the other thing that, that, that um, I would say to them uh, truly is to say, and this is, a, this is a question that I think all of us, we, we have to ask when we're doing this type of research is, what do you want from your state? You keep complaining about your state. You say it's not doing anything. It's not there. They're doing this. What is it? What's your definition of a state? What do you want from the state? What do you see in a state? What does the state mean to you? Um, therefore, then maybe potentially you can you can you can move forward on this point and not just continuously relying on the same people that don't provide alternatives. And so, I think. You know, I, I would say to them that the Lebanese, um, and till this day, I still say the same thing. And I, you know, I constantly have conversations with them about this and with other colleagues and friends, um, Lebanese and otherwise, I would say to them, you know, Lebanese, uh, the Lebanese people have to have a conversation about what a state is and what they actually want from their state and forget building it according to the French system, forget building it according to the American system, forget building it according to XYZ system. Let's just start at the beginning and ask these questions. Because, you know, one thing my dad keeps complaining about, he still lives in Lebanon, he keeps complaining about, which is very understandable, is that there's corruption, there's corruption, there's corruption, there's corruption. 
And I understand that. And he keeps thinking that elections are gonna bring new faces and it will change the process. And I understand how he's thinking about it, but we can only get that change if people integrate and engage with their state and know what they want with their state and see it as legitimate. If they don't see it as legitimate, they're not gonna see the change. Um, and, you know, I, I would, talking to one of my colleagues and I said to them, you know, to me, what's really important when we're looking at these places, instead of judging them and thinking they're less than, we need to understand them. And one really key point that we forget, we keep forgetting, I think, um, when, when we're, when, as scholars specifically, when we're, when we're researching these places is to assume that if we have a democratic system, it's going to work, um, but we're, we're forgetting the human part of it. And so I always talk about a tennis game, you know, uh, democratic institutions or government, let's say, does something emblemic to throwing the ball over to the other end of the court. Re democracy requires that the people in society throws the ball back to the government. Um, if the society is not there to throw the ball back to the government, there's no game, there's no tennis, and the government can do whatever it wants and, you know, abuse and work around and, and do whatever. And so the idea of a democracy requires people to be engaged with the state and believe in the state and work with the state. And it's not waiting for this to happen, because in the meantime, as we're waiting, a lot of abuse is happening, um, abuse of the state by these leaders. And so I would say, I would, I, I would, you know, to myself and to my own parents, I would say to them, I understand you, but we need to play the game. Like we need to be more invested in building something in building a state that works. And so what are we trying to do from that perspective as an alternative to supporting the same people that keep undoing it? Thank you. Thank you. That's really interesting. And I'm still, still perplexed by the fact that a 10 year old Ruby was so thoughtful and also judgmental. <laughs> I, I was a tough kid when I was young. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, it's super interesting. And I was just staying in Lebanon and, and, and with, with the experience here, I was just wondering whether you could, you know, explain a little bit more, or give examples of, of how that looks like when there's a, there's a leader who is working from within state institutions, right? But and, and, and gaining the, that performance legitimacy, but not using that to build up the, the state. How does it look like? How, what, and how does it look like for the for the, the population who has still to deal with this uh, this leadership? Right? Just you know, paint paint a little bit of picture for us how that how that looks like. Sure. I you know I could use so many examples, um, but I'm in, I'm going to use one that I think is extremely uh, because of the importance of it, but also the clarity of it. Uh, would be really helpful. So if you look back at that prime minister that was assassinated, um, Rafi al Hariri, uh, he was a prime minister that came in in the early 90s after the end of the civil war, um, was not a politician at all. Uh, and he led the, uh, the, the Sunni uh, population in Lebanon and he was brought into the system. And what was really interesting about what he did, which took a while for me to even be able to see it um, and unpack it, uh, Initially, when he came in and he started, you know, he was put in as a prime minister, he started offering um, free uh, university scholarships for, for students who wanted to go to university. And then also a little bit of free services here and there. And he became popular and his name, you know, he, he, there were sort of positive sentiments by across the group, not only just the Sunnis, but, you know, a lot of the Christian groups and, and, and some of the Shia groups, uh, some of the Shia populations and the Druze and so forth. And so he, he really built up this persona by taking care of people's basic needs. And then when, it, when he started after a few years, um, every time there was a project that he was approving as a prime minister, he would talk about what he was doing to the people. And the language stopped being about Lebanon and the Lebanese state. And it was more about, I am bringing mm. you this. I am doing this for you. But was also really interesting at the time, and people didn't really see it happening because we didn't have access to the information, is that he was taking on policies that were destroying the state. So making it more of a shell um, and a lot of corruption and a lot of control mechanisms within the state on what is allowed and what is not allowed. But he was building a pseudo state on the side. So if you wanted to have services, you'd go to him and ask him, he'd call somebody or his people would call somebody who would then make it faster for you to get this document. Meanwhile, what the document that used to take two weeks 
now takes six months if you were to go to the government, right? So that undoing of the state at the same time, that building of a pseudo state and his um, ability to explain how much, you know, what he was doing to the population uh, really was, you know, people started talking about how Hariri brought us this, Hariri did this for us and not about state the state even though this is money coming from the state it wasn't his billionaire dollars except for some of the scholarship issues and stuff like that but you know th the projects the state projects were state projects they were state projects but the way that people saw them even though they had the lebanese flag on them and it says ministry of what you know name it the way he explained it was that it was him mm. and so people really started um, seeing him as the person who was helping and not the actual state itself. So that sort of protected him from the other um, criticisms about corruption, the other criticisms about undoing the state, the other criticisms about being at some point a puppet to Syria, this and that, whatever. He was completely protected from that. So, and it was a game that he, he ultimately played. Yeah. I think that's an excellent example and that, that really illustrates the point and the, you know one of the key things you said is that at some point it would take two, two months to get a permit if you went through him and his network, but six months the game is the same permit if you apply the official channel and I think that, 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 that is a very good illustration of how, how authorities be built by using uh, by pro providing these, these services. And, I think and, that and at the same time, sorry to cut you off, Krista, because at the same time, there were investments in the Lebanese state to build its capacity. So it's not like there weren't any investments to make it more, um, to make it more efficient and effective. Yes, there was corruption um, and they were diverting the money, but there was investment being put in. But they were able to divert the money because mm. of their ability to kind of sell this to the public. I think that's very relevant. It's also relevant that what it just mentioned that, that brings me to a next question I wanted to ask. You mentioned that there was there was capacity building on the way. So 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 donors supported that that government, which at uh, at the same time was being hollowed out by the recipients of the capacity building uh, capacity train, right? Yeah. Uh, that is something that we can observe almost in, in all of these countries. It's, it, it, it's almost a pattern. Uh, another example would be in, uh, in South Sudan, the Norwegian really, really invested in, in they invest a lot in, in South Sudan, but they also invest in capacity building um, because the natural resource sector is so important, the oil sector. They also invested in capacity building in the oil sector, which resulted in a very paradox outcome. The people who, who were trained there got better at doing stuff, but they use these expertise to more, ef more ef uh, efficiently steal the oil, right? So it didn't, it did, they had more capacity, they had more training, but they just use it to build up that, that parallel state, right? And that's a huge, huge paradox uh, and, and it's a problem. Um, so when donors do not understand the mechanism which you, which you just described, which in, in a way when donors don't understand the political economy of such places, they will provide training and aid and capacity building, which doesn't really help but make things even worse. So the question then is, and uh, I don't expect you to, to, to really have an answer, but at least I'm very interested in your thoughts. What, what do you suggest donors do in such a situation? Is there, is there anything, you know, use sensible they can do at all or, or not? Or what would be, you know, the, the you, your kind of suggestions to the donors you want to help Lebanon with capacity building? So, so the first, you know, when I was working at CEDA um, and I was working on Lebanon, uh, Palestine, um, you know, the Middle East in general, one thing that I realized was that uh, a lot of people assumed because there was war um, that there wasn't legitimacy or because the state wasn't functioning, there wasn't legitimacy. And that the first thing that I would say to donors is um, understand what people feel and see and hear as legitimacy and don't go back to the same NGOs that use Western mechanisms to measure legitimacy. Um, I think that's the first job that they have to do because going in assuming that there isn't legitimacy because according to the indicators that they use, legitimacy is not strong. 
is going in and, and playing with fire, basically, because then they don't recognize exactly that dynamic of these leaders being inside the state institution and abusing the state institution because they can't. Um, and, and the lack that, that the people are not really playing tennis against Mm. all the leaders but only against some of the leaders right and so i think that that part i think is is really important even before going in just better understanding the lay of the land when it comes to legitimacy in in the country um and not just assuming that it's corruption and not just assuming that it's bad governance instead of good governance the second thing that i would say um to donors is is and this is this is going to be harsh but you know i would say to them uh Assuming because we believe that democratic systems are the most advanced systems, the most ethical, ethical, the most moral, assuming that those are the ones that should be implemented anywhere and everywhere with slight changes, um, and that everything should be feeding into the system right away, right now, um, is setting us up for disaster. Um, in, in, in us as, as, as people seeing these things unfolding, but also myself, for example, when it comes to Lebanon as a Lebanese, setting up the, Le the Lebanese uh, uh, disaster. Um, you know, all the talk now about donors supporting elections, new elections, donors supporting good governance in Lebanon is scary to me because I would, you know, I, I, I often also, when I talk about this, I, I, I compare it to the Trojan horse. Um, where, you know, leaders are going to say, yes, yes, we'll work on corruption. Yes, yes, you're right. Yes, 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 yes. But they're the ones who ultimately are passing the policies. They're the ones who ultimately are working through the system. And yes, we can hold them to account because it, it's eight dollars that are coming in. But at the same time, there are just so many things they can do. So much rhetoric that they can use that no matter how much we try with transparency and accountability to hold them um, to hold them to account, it doesn't really function that much. So the idea of assuming that we have to start with that um, and then everything will come along the way is ignoring these 10, 15, whatever number of years that research has shown us would be required for people to engage with the system mm -hmm. properly, quote unquote, um, for it to function properly, quote unquote. Those 10 years, we're basically handing it over to these leaders to do basically what they always have done. And then you know, stop questioning why there's still corruption, stop questioning why they're still taking advantage of the system and 10 years down the line really hasn't improved that much. Yeah. I mean, just to add on that a little bit, um, I've been working over the last two years or so on, on a couple of, not a couple, on three uh, meta reviews on aid to the most fragile countries in the world. So I was basically looking at uh, at collecting all the evidence we have on on, on aid of effectiveness in in over the last was it 12 or the all the the evidence on aid effectiveness over the last 12 years to afghanistan mali and south sudan and then looking at different sectors and you know the results are very very sobering there's zero effectiveness in these countries when it comes to aid for good governance democracy anti-corruption all the things it's just you know it, it it gets lost in that system of political economy and and the, the result is zero absolutely zero right and i think so, it's important when you know i remember when i was um when i was first starting off with this phd research this exactly um and after having spoken to you i had met with somebody else and they basically said to me are you trying to say that non-Western countries who have conflict are not capable, are less than? And my answer is no, they're not not capable. They're very capable. But because they're very capable and the system is not necessarily ad adapted properly to their circumstances, they're very capable also of using it and turning it into something that benefits them as well. So it's not because they're backwards that they can't, it's quite the opposite. It's because you know they're taking something and adjust it for, to work for their reality. And then they're yeah. moving forward with it, um, and it's not a judgment on on, on them necessarily. You know, every time, it's funny because when I was talking to my dad before I wanted to start uh, my PhD research, and then he said to me, "Okay, so what are you going to be working on?" And I told him, and he said, "I thought that was common knowledge. What are you talking about? Like, really, you're going to spend five years, six years studying this? Yeah. Ruby, yeah. go do something else." Yeah. And then I, you know, I talked to other family members, and they said the same thing, and then. You know, it kind of shocked me a little bit because I'm educated university-wise in Canada. I'm not educated and I, I know the dynamics, but 
you know, and then I started speaking to people from Afghanistan, I, you know, especially because I was TAing in Carlton too. So I had access to people from Latin America, you know, Africa, Asia, and, you know, they're sitting there saying, yeah, it works perfectly. It, you know, I can understand it back home. Then, And so when I started seeing this, mm -hmm. I was like, Okay, so we know this. We, as in me, as in like a person coming from this, this, this type of conflict, we know this. But yet, why isn't it showing up in the scholarship that is accepted at the sort of yeah. you know the international level? Um, and so it again, it, it's it's not a way to. It's not a way to say they're less than. It's quite the opposite. It's to say they know this. We don't. Yeah. So yeah. here, please pay attention yeah. to this. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It's uh, I have a similar experiences in my. Uh, in my classes on fragile states, uh, where I have always students from 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 fr fragile states or people with the you know first hand experiences, and the reaction when we talk about these things, and when I'm trying to give a, a vocabulary or a terminology or a framework for understanding of what's going on, the reaction is people who have never traveled or never lived in a country like that, you know, the, what that is really interesting. Is that different? But then the reaction from people who actually have lived in these countries is, you know, of course, sometimes it's of course, and you know, but I never knew that we could use this terminology. So it was like giving a terminology to, to everyday experiences, but it is really like two different universes and people from one universe understand this and they also don't see it as something that went wrong or uh, uh, something that, you know, didn't just, turn out as it, it, it's perceived as as as, as normal right um we have half an hour left and i want to slowly slowly move on to to the the questions from the audience but i have one 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 last question and that is you you painted you showed us a very a very complicated complicated graph which is basically two paths. One is the good and one is the bad one. The bad one is the vicious circle. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've been talking about that vicious circle uh, quite extensively now. Um, and I think that's the usual path. I think that's, you know, I think that's what's happening. As another footnote, I was trying to look at how many countries actually exited fragility over the last 20 years. So from a very low level to, to, to a lesser level, and the results are very, very sobering. It's very, very few countries. And these countries who made it out of fragility are not the countries we're talking about. They're countries who, for, you know, for one reason or another, slipped into fragility, but then climbed back to where they belonged before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's, 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 it's not a country like uh, um, none of the most fragile countries ever, ever exits right? because of that uh, vicious circle. But you also have the virtuous circle. Right. And you have one case study, which is Senegal. So there are occasionally a way out. Yeah. And my last question to you would be, could you, could you, you know, tell us a little bit more about you know, how the stars have to be aligned so that a country actually can, you know, start on that path of a, a virtuous circle? So I have to say, um, and this is this, this finding the virtuous circle took me an extremely long time. And I was panicking because I didn't want this research to be all about here, this is what's wrong and kind of the, the, the information reinforces itself type of thing. And so people then, clear, you, which legitimately could ask about the bias in the research. So I had to, I really was really wanting to understand and find a virtuous uh, circle. Now, having said this, there are cases in the middle. So it doesn't have to go all really bad or all really good. There are cases where some ministries, for example, some state structures have performance legitimacy and then some leaders have performance legitimacy. In them. So that's a continuum per se, but the, the case of Senegal that, which was really, really interesting for me um, when I was looking at Senegal, because Senegal has been um, really, criticized significantly for its really weak democracy, really weak democratic system, um, significant corruption, uh, significant nepotism, uh, and so forth. And so when I was unpacking the case of, Afghan of, of, of Senegal, to me, what really stood out was they had resources to um, like, as I said earlier, they're little pockets where they could spend money, little bank accounts where they could spend money to earn um, votes uh, from their local population. But yet that never allowed them or never 
gave them the opportunity to claim it as being from them. And so when I dug deeper, I realized and I had, and I interviewed some really um, very thoughtful people and people also from the Casa Mosque because it was in, you know, the, the, the independence movement and the, and the war was more in the Casa Mosque area. But I, I interviewed people. And one thing that really stood out for me was that people um, really understood the importance of the state um, and the presence of the state. And that was from colonial times even. Um, and the Marabouts, who were the religious leaders, also turned to the state. So the state really played an important role. And so the state society relationship was existed. And there were no brokers like in Lebanon or like in South Sudan, for example, no brokers between the people and the state. There was that relationship. So that one, one thing was really important. The other thing that was very important is that None of the, because it wasn't a perfectly, as, as a lot of people have criticized it to be a perfectly democratic system, I actually looked at these criticisms and I tried to put them within the context of the functioning of the state. And what I realized is that what they're being criticized about, which is that sort of um, non-democratic uh, influence over others, um, that was what was leading for people to people being controlled within the state and not being able to claim too much. And so that maneuvering space was limited by, by that sort of undemocratic influence from the inside um, and that sort of balancing out of the power dynamics. And so for me, those are, you know, the, the presence of state legitimacy, uh, state society relationship, but also those internal dynamics and societal dynamics that makes it sh such that there is um, influence and control over each other, not just because it's a democratic system. So it's not a system thing. It's more like a societal structure um, made it such that that abuse, that maneuvering space wasn't available for everybody or anybody really. There were severe consequences if somebody really stepped out of line. And so I thought, you know, for me, this is something we need to study a lot more because we often talk about corruption and criticize bad governance. Uh, from a democratic perspective, but I think there are some of these that could actually benefit uh, the means to control others within the state. Thank you. At this point, I would like to um, to ask, oh, there's another question. Um, the three questions in the chat, two of, two of those are very complicated and I have to reread them so that I understand them myself. There's a third one, which is a, which is straightforward and I understand. And so Ruby started with the third one, uh, which is, do you think that donors should then refrain from investing aid in good governance for countries such as Lebanon? Should they be investing in their ODA in other sectors instead? That's a very straightforward question that's very difficult to answer. Extremely difficult to answer um, because it, you know, it, I always say to people, you know, stopping AIDS is really bad in a sense where a lot of people need aid to survive. So this is something that we have to be careful of. Do we stop it for good governance? I would say in the Lebanese, specifically the Lebanese situation, I would say pause it um, for now. I wouldn't say potentially stop it for forever. I would say pause it. And the reason why I'm saying pause it is because what we know about Lebanon um, is that even with elections, yes, we have the same people that Get, keep getting recycled, but we also have new faces. And these new faces, when they go in with time, they become like the old faces. Um, and so that change is not necessarily something that we um, have really witnessed in Lebanon per se. So, you know, as I said, Rafi al-Hariri was new um, and yet he did the same thing. Um, some, some, you know, some of the leaders that came up are sons of others, but some are new and yet they recycled the same thing. And I don't think that at this moment in time, investing in good governance through state uh, is necessarily the right way of doing it. What I would say um, is that I think a significant amount of, of, of funding in my opinion, should go into really understanding or, or into research that understands what people want from the state, because we've never done that, and then see how we can build that system and structure to actually give the people what they want from the state, or at least a common perspective of what it is. Um, so I think if we think about governance, this is the perfect way to think about governance because you're actually listening to the people and you're actually doing the research that's necessary to try to understand what type of governance works best in Lebanon. Now, people would tell me, and they have often told me, well, what about the religious divisions? And I would often say to them, and this is what I would repeat here, is, you know, even within specific religious groups, 
So if I was to take, for example, the Shia group, you know, uh, Hassan, Nasrallah, and Hezbollah were able to gain significant legitimacy, even though Birri was there and he was also the Shia leader. And so there, the, and the difference was performance legitimacy. And so the idea again is that it's not performance legitimacy. Yes, religion is important, but it's also more at the base. And this is something that happens within groups as well. So the idea of going in and checking and seeing from a governance perspective what the population wants, I think then can allow us to properly respond. And then we can have that time tennis game between the people and the state, um, and then build something that, that requires this tennis game. As far as spending it on sectors, we have to be careful too, because again, if you want to spend it on sectors, uh, are you spending it on the Ministry of Education, let's say? If you're spending it on the Ministry of Education, is the Minister of Education going to take perform, you know, claim it as his um, and, and, or hers and, 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 and claim performance legitimacy? You give it to NGOs, potentially in the process if it's a transitional sure if it's long term again no because they could get performance legitimacy so it's a very complicated question but i think again nothing will change if we don't come up with a governance system that speaks to the people and we have to come up with a governance system that speaks to the people because at the center of the governance system is the state and the state has to be something that people believe in otherwise we're just going to have leaders Sobering, but uh, I think you're absolutely right. Um, let's move on to another question. There's a question by Mot Nasemi, and it's a two part question. You can also read them, right, Ruby, on, on your yes, screen. I'm, I'm looking at them, yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's a two part question. Uh, uh, and I, I do think we talked about the first part a little bit about the uh, vicious versus uh, virtuous circle. Why don't then you focus on the second part? And it is how do you define legitimacy in countries with a central system where the power is under a group of the corrupt elite? Even there might be legitimacy. Yes, there might be legitimacy, right? Yes. And in yes. practice, those corrupt leaders seize the power by fraud and misuse. And then the example of Ghani, right? So mm -hmm. how, 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 how does one deal with that? I think, you know, I. Part of my research initially led me to Afghanistan um, and looking at what was happening in Afghanistan because a lot was written at that time um, still is about, about the experience in Afghanistan and, and having spoken to you as well at that time. Um, you know, I think from my understanding, and I'm not Afghan, so I have to be very careful in what I say. I don't have that much legitimacy to really speak that much about Afghanistan. But from my understanding, um, these leaders who were in the government, who were part of the elite, who were part of the central government, um, were able to buy off their leadership and buying off their leadership by keeping some people in line. And how were they able to keep these people in line? It's, again, by giving them access to certain resources or dividing it up. Uh, dividing up the portfolios in a way that benefited some over the other. And how were they were able to stay there or get the support of some part of the population is because they use those resources to give these populations some of the basic needs. And so I think, um, you know, absolutely, when you do have a centralized system, there's still legitimacy. Um, there's still legitimacy. You have some of it that is associated with the system, but a lot of it also associated with performance legitimacy and a lot of it associated with the performance legitimacy that these leaders are giving the president. Um, so, you know, if, if they're getting money to spend on their people to get performance legitimacy, that means that in this case, Ghani, Ghani was earning legitimacy by giving it to his people. So his, his, the leaders or the other people in the government. So it's a kind of chain reaction of performance legitimacy. And I don't see, I don't see an exception to that. Um, again, it, it really, it's a perception of the population, but part of the population are also the leaders that are inside the state and how they deal with other leaders. And so he was, he, I mean, really all of them are, are capable of sort of buying their presence through that, that type of trickle down approach. Thank you. There's one more, more question in the Q&A section, and that is from Stephen Barani where he first says that uh, an important part of your analysis is, sorry, an important part of your analysis is tension between building the performance legitimacy of states versus more personalized approaches. And then the question is, to this analysis, how would Southern, how did Southern scholars and practitioners reacting to that? 
So what, what will be the, you know, the reaction of them versus us? And is what's the perspective of them versus us, me versus them? I think we started talking about that a little bit at the beginning, you, know, you and your parents, and then uh, the example of when you present this kind of findings uh, in, in uh, orthodox Western circles, there's a, a surprise and with a, intellectuals from these countries it's more like yes of course that's how it is yeah but but anyway we're, we're... so i you know i would say the overwhelming majority of people from the south who have who i've spoken to um again have been people who have said my god this explains what's happened in my country like i've never put these put it in this way or i've never connected these dots or i've never used this word but absolutely you know i even had a student I think last week, I don't know if the student is here with us, but I had a student last week who said to me, Ruby, this is so Somalia, right? Like it, it, it resonates with a lot of them. But although two things I have to point out, um, some of the Southern scholars that, are, that have been, um, that have studied in Western countries per se, if I could use it that way in the North, um, who, or who truly believe in the importance of a democratic system and a democracy as the sole uh, solution, um, have critics, have not necessarily accepted what I have tried to put forward um, on several fronts. One of them being that they think that I am undermining uh, or saying they cannot be like that. They cannot have a democratic system per se. Uh, but also, I've been criticized by not only them, but also a lot by people in more orthodox um, environments um, about minimizing the importance of the morality or the moral value associated with a democracy, democratic systems, human rights, rule of law, and so forth. And, you know, often when, when discussing this with them and kind of, you know, unpacking that a little bit more, my answer often to them, other than the one that I gave already about whether they can't or they can or they're less than, you know, the, we've already talked about that. The other part is I say to them, I'm not saying that democracy should never be achieved. I'm not saying that, you know, the, 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 the level of morality that's associated with a democratic system, rule of law, uh, um, uh, you know, transparency, accountability, and all of that is, is not important. However, in my opinion, um, and from my research that I have done, getting to that level and having it function more positively um, requires that we, we embark on a different route. Um, we cannot get to that level if the state is not legitimate in the eyes of the population. There's no way we'll end up at that level. Well, there's no way, very limited possibility for us to end up at that level. Second, you know, if we're sitting there and we're talking about the issues of morality and ethics, I personally think, especially, you know, maybe it's colored by my own experience, but when you're in the midst of a war or in a post-conflict situation, you know, um, having access to food, water, electricity, shelter, protection is moral and is very ethical. And that is, that is the minimum that, you know, if we aim for that, I think we're aiming for a lot already, especially if the alternative is not providing that. Um, and the realization that, if other leaders are providing that, it means that we're missing an opportunity and that missed opportunity allows these leaders to then have uh, more power or more undermining power over a longer period of time. So the consequences are likely to be also um, quite significant. And again, you know, and I always, I always have to say this and we've had this conversation, me and you, Christoph, is to say, you know, I'm not saying democracy is not good because I've been accused by some, especially people in the West to say, oh, well, are you trying to say that democracy is not good? And the answer is absolutely not. I, you know, I, I, I believe in democracy. Um, I remember that when I, you know, when I did my research on, on Senegal and, and I found, you know, that maneuvering space issue and what it actually meant. And I came to the conclusion, I remember panicking and I remember walking into the head of the, of the, um, of the PhD program to say, Saul, I think I'm going to quit. I think I'm not, I'm not going to go through with this. Thank you so much. I'm done because it was so uh, scary for me to find uh, or, or to even write or to, for even anybody to understand that I or, or think that I'm suggesting that I would prefer an authoritative regime over a democratic regime. That's not absolutely not what it is, but that we need to 
again, look at other alternatives in how we would ultimately get to a democratic system if that's the right system in, in that situation. So I think this is, so people who, people from the South who kind of um, question my work, question it on these two levels, right? Like, are you telling us that we're, we're lower than not capable or are you, are you telling us that, that democratic system is not the right system for, yeah. for us? And it's, it's neither, it's neither. Um, it's just really think of, thinking of it as a process. You know, we, we didn't build democracies in 10 years. We didn't build them in 15 years. It took a very long time and there were a lot of pieces that had to fall into place to get to there. Um, and the idea is that if we're speeding through, we're not realizing what we're starting with. It's not a blank slate. It's not an empty page. And that we're not realizing, you know, the missing pieces along the way. And just to, to answer the, the the hour versus we um, hours, uh, I think for me the way that I, I I worded the title of our is our is in sort of the not only the West but more the Orthodox uh, or the spaces that are the that are the most common spaces or the research that is most common. Uh, I think I kind of touched on that earlier to say that it's it's not like what the majority thinks. So that's the our part. Um, and you know, when I say we, this is this is a mistake I make all the time. And I think this is this is emblematic of an immigrant having one foot over there and one foot over here. Sometimes when I say we, I mean we in the West, and sometimes when I say we, I mean we in Lebanon. So it depends on the on on the uh, on the comments, Stephen. I'm not I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I want to add a little bit here because I think that's a, such an important question. And uh, we had this discussion before. I never fully understood this kind of accusations, right? Uh, but that may be because uh, I feel more socialized in, 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 in era studies. So people, you know, Africanists or uh, social anthropologists, and they used this kind of uh, description of, of, of uh, realities on the ground, which mu much less moral baggage. But what I want you to say here is, I, I don't think an analysis of the political economy of the ground and how things work is a moral statement. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's not a moral statement. It, it, it's just, it's an analysis. And then saying that it's in some systems, it's really, really complicated and difficult and unlikely to break through a different form of governance is still not a moral judgment, right? It, it is, is an analysis. In substantial terms, I, I think it's very, very difficult for, for countries like, like uh, South Sudan or uh, uh, Lebanon to break through a democratic type of governance, but I don't think it's impossible. Uh, I just think, uh, you know, the stars are not aligned and for example, in Afghanistan, what would have happened is, and why it didn't happen is, there would have been a massive national movement, a movement with one unifying idea, so that Afghans would rally around that idea. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't there because religion was taken away from the government because the Taliban occupied religion. National unity is very difficult when you have so many uh, uh, ethnic groups. It's very, very difficult. And that's basically it, the national independence or, or, or religion. That would be, you know, a framework for such rallying ideas, which wasn't there. So if, if that's the case, then there could be a breakthrough. And the other thing I want to say is, if we speak about morality, right, uh, I, I would kind of uh, flip the argument and say, what is not moral, in my view, is continual giving aid to sectors which we have by now proven again and again and again do not work, right? It is not, it is unethical to give money to programs which do not work in a world where there's so much need. The ethical thing to do is to actually acknowledge that in many of these countries, aid for democracy, aid for good governance, aid for women's rights, it's well-intentioned, it doesn't work. But the needs are so big that then why don't why don't then you know simple straightforward stuff like water food shelter it's not going to fix anything but at least it gives human beings dignity for a while right so that, that would be my moral argument it's, it's actually not not ethical to continue doing things which we know based on such analysis as yours are very difficult to achieve we have 10 minutes left but no questions, no more 
Christ should. Oh, there's one more. Yeah. Yes, my inter insider outsider positionality. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I I find personally, I find that if 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 you don't identify your positionality and if you don't talk about who you represent or how you see things, I think you know you 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 you're not really forthcoming with the results of your research. Um, and you know it. It's interesting for me because, you know, every time I talk about research and I talk about, especially with my students, for example, we talk about decentralizing or we talk about positionality and we talk about decolonizing re research and so forth. I, you know, it, I also, when I do research, I also, you know, think about myself, but at the same time, I don't remove my experience from my research because I find that it, it is what animates my interest. It is what animates how, I understand certain things and having, you know, having worked in the private sector, having worked in the government and then having, you know, now being in academia and having lived in various countries, it, it, it really enriches how I look at things. And I'm, I, I, can make link, I can make links that others don't make. Having said this though, I do have many moments and I have to also, you know, I think, again, that's part of my lived experience, uh, but it's also part of, I think very much of how much pushback that I've gotten from, from especially people in the West is a lot of times I also question whether, you know, what I am saying is actually accurate or is a representative of what is actually happening rather than it being filtered through my own lens. And uh, however, I would say to that is, is when that happens, I sit down and I do uh, an analysis and I, you know, and then I realized that actually, no, it's good that I'm questioning myself because if I'm questioning myself, I'm aware of this. But yeah, my positionality and where I am, that insider outsider part is, is, you know, it complicates things, but it also gives me access to so much that otherwise I wouldn't have access to. And, you know, it, I think for me, the fact that so many people, um, especially, you know, the, the new generation, um, and especially people living in, in non-Western countries, tell me that this is, this explains things to them, or this is, wow, so clear, or they can really, um, they can really appreciate what is, what is, what I'm, what I'm trying to do, or what I'm trying to research. I mean, for me, that's, that, that is a clue that I should continue, right? That is a clue that it's a, it's a, it's a door that I've opened that very few people have opened before. And so I'm hoping that this is the beginning of something that's much longer and, and much bigger. Well, I definitely hope you will continue this and that we will have in the in the near future or middle future a new a new book launch oh. with uh, volume two on that topic. Yeah. So thank you very, very much, Ruby. I thought it was a really, really interesting, thought provoking, uh, stimulating way to spend uh, our lunchtime. I enjoyed the conversation and presentation a lot. Uh, I think we have reached uh, uh, the end, um, Ruby. Is there one thing you want to add before the session is officially closed by Anna? I just want to say thank you for everybody. Uh, honestly, thank you for the questions. Really interesting questions. Um, if you're interested in in more, if you'd like to reach out to me, let me know. Uh, this is again a, a, a one of one of my projects, but this is the one I think I'm the most passionate about, and the one that I I'm hoping. I'm hoping to contribute a lot too. So thank you so much for your interest and for the questions. And thank you, Christoph, for your continued support from day one. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for, for joining us, for uh, attending this, this uh, book launch. It's been very interesting. It's also a pleasure to having these, uh, these questions and discussion. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. See you soon. Thank you.